find a seat. There are a couple seats in the second row here. You can sit there if you're not too tall. Bro, you might be too tall. And then we'll, you're gonna, we'll find a seat for you when we start the quiz. Cool? So we're only going to have class for about a half hour. So, yeah, you can come in the second row. Two people can sit there. All right, so a couple, couple, uh, yo, bro. Okay, uh, so I want to give you, we're going to go backwards, actually. Um, so I sent an email out, I sent a text message out. Let me just emphasize one quick thing. This, um, hang on. So if you want to join uh, World in Conversation as an entry-level facilitator, which would be facilitating groups for Social 19, and... and you know, we're, we're doing it different next semester. So if you have friends who are signing up for the class, you no longer will sign up for a discussion group that throughout the semester, people will be joining discussion groups um, with other people in class. Every discussion group you join, you, you it will be with a different mix of people. Um, we will not have weekly groups, but they'll end up being kind of like bi-weekly. I think we'll do maybe five or six of, for the semester. Um, so it's just one big lecture class that you sign up for starting in the fall. And so if you have friends and they're confused, like, what's this about? That's what it is. Um, it's a lot easier. Uh, it'll be more straightforward. But facilitating those groups will be kind of entry level at World in Conversation. And the World in Conversation team will be training the facilitators. And it will be a little bit less work than TAs right now. Um, and uh, maybe the same amount, but either way, it's about five hours a week. So you, you go to a training class and then you do two groups a week. So uh, if you're, you don't have to know your class schedule. That, that's the thing that people hold off on. They're like, yeah, I'm really interested. Just go to these, just sign up for what we call a dip and get it, just get the information about what you need to do. It's, it's, a, it's really an awesome experience. And next semester, the students in 119, um, and you, if you're one of the facilitators, will be doing a lot, a lot of dialogues with students in other countries around the world. So it's like really, we're going to internationalize that component of it a fair amount. Um, so that feels good. Uh, this is next Wednesday. We have the tickets here. So when you turn in your quizzes uh, at the end of class, either here or over there, um, you can pick up a ticket. Don't lose them. Please. Okay? Good? Um, Yo, Sam, about being a TA, it's one of the coolest opportunities you can actually do here. Um, I was a TA a couple years ago, and I still talk to people every once in a while who has a TA with, and they still use facilitation every day. One of the biggest things that people want to look at is if you can be a communicator, and most of us can't be. So if you learn how to facilitate, you're going to learn an amazing communication skill that can be used for the rest of your life. Yeah, it's a really, it's a cool thing. I'm not a facilitator, but uh, it's cool. It's a really cool skill. So strongly encourage you. Uh, next thing. Okay, shithole nations. That's what uh, shithole nations should be plural. But isn't that what Donald Trump called, like, all like, these countries that are sending their people to us, like, shithole nations? Uh <laughs> Anyway, um, what I want to do is in, in the last third of the class, we usually do this kind of toward the beginning of class, but we're actually going to do it more toward the last third. Uh, I'm going to start talking about inequality issues a little bit because we haven't really touched on that. And today, it, in a way, is the, 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 the first kind of just foray into that a little bit because... Um, you know, it's one of the, the questions we all have, right? Like, why do, why, are, why do some people, why are some people, have, why do they have a lot of resources and other people don't? And why do, why are some countries so much more wealthy than other countries? And um, there's no easy answer to it, to those kinds of questions. Uh, and it's it's almost always a mix of, Things that people do 
to themselves and things that, that countries do to themselves and then things that other countries do to them or things that other people do to them and then chance, just random experiences. So, you know, those of you who have uh, family members who, who just happen to be born into a family with more resources are probably going to end up with more resources than those of you who are born into a family with less resources. And if you're born in a country with more resources, you're probably going to end up born or, you know, dying in a country with more resources. Um, that's just kind of how it is. And things can change, but they don't change that much. And I know that there's an, there is a, uh, like a belief in, in here in the United States in particular of what we talk about as a, a, achievement ideology, but um, that if you work really hard, you know, you'll get ahead and so on. Or in, in this particular case, we're going to just talk briefly about countries today. If you have a country of people, they work really hard, they'll get ahead. But um, that's really, it's, it's just not, that's only a small part of it. And sometimes it's the only part of it. There's a lot of people in here, you know, that, uh, like here, that, that all of you, if you all work really, really, really hard, some of you are still going to get a he further ahead. It's just there's so much chance involved. Um, but one of the things that I experience is how w people in wealthier countries try to make sense of the existence of people in poorer countries. And nobody, you know, we... We, it's always a lot easier if you put blame onto other people um, because it just allows, it's a lot easier to go sleep at night and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and so, I, oh man, I wish, I, it's so hard for me to talk about this because I, there's so much I want to say and I'm just trying to be thoughtful. Um, let me just ask you this question. Let me just start, like, breaking into the ideology bit. What, what do you think is the answer to that question there? Um, what percentage of that budget do we spend on non-military foreign aid? Okay, so, um, so what we're talking about is this, uh, you know, refugees and housing, AIDS, HIV, uh, prevention and adjustment and food, natural disasters, population control, transportation, I mean, all these things, right? What percentage of the $4 trillion do we in the United States spend on these things, really helping other countries and the rest of the world? What do you, what do you think? Just what's, what's your gut? Come up with a number. What's that? What's the number? What do you think, bro? What do, you, what do you think? What do you think? What percentage? You know, because we're really, you know, we help a lot of countries around the world. Like, well, how much do we spend? What's your gut? You know, any answer is a good answer. What's your gut? Just a, just a quick answer. There's no right answer here. I'm, what's your, what's your gut? What do you think? What's your gut? No, percent. Oh, percent. Okay. Come up fast. What percent? U.S. Ten. Dude. Fifteen? Yo, what do you think? Eight? What do you think? Ten. Okay. I mean, think about it, right? What, what, what do you think? What's the answer, right? So... So let me show you a couple things. Um, first off, the U.S. is, this is, these are numbers from 2015. The numbers always go back a couple years. I looked at the, I, you know, I couldn't get numbers for any more recent than 2016, but then the graph wasn't as nice, so I just chose this one. It doesn't change very much. Um, you can see that the U.S. is the most generous nation in terms of giving money to in non-military foreign aid. So look at this, right? That's a lot of money. And um, look at, this is in millions of dollars. 
So that's a lot of money. That's 30, 30 billion dollars. Okay. Look at then we got Germany and look down here. So this, it's a lot of money. Okay. So this is big. The U.S. We're generous in that way. And then if we look at the percentage um, of international aid rankings, okay. So what percentage of our GDP do we give? So that $4 trillion. Well, Norway is a little over 1%. Um, look at Luxembourg, Sweden, the Scandinavian countries are all up there. We come down, we come down. And then here's the United States, less than a half of a percent. Right there is the U.S. In fact, about 0.3%. And this target is 07 So if we look at this and we say, okay, hang on. What percentage of our $4 trillion budget do we give away? And then we look at, okay, what is it? Who are we helping? What are we doing? How are we helping them? We look at all the money we give away. And then here's what it is. Here's where we rank. So the question then becomes, are we the most generous? How do you answer that question? It's like yes and no. In terms of the absolute money we give, we're the most generous, but not in terms of the percentage of what we could give. So it's sort of like this thing. Let me just make this, let me put this out there to you, right? If I said, hey, class, we're collecting money for, I don't know, a project somewhere. I don't know, for somebody, for some issue. And I want everyone to chip in. You got two options, right? One, you can just chip in $10. Or you can chip in as appropriate to the income that your family makes if you receive benefits from that income. And so if some people in your class have parents that make $10 million a year and you have parents that make $25,000 a year and you were giving $10, you had to give $10, and they, with $10 million, also gave 5 or $10, the same amount as you, how would you feel about that? Would you feel like, no, that's cool, that's fair, this is really stretching my budget really hard because i got to give up $10 and I don't have a lot of money because I can't even afford the textbook for my econ class. But the person sitting next to you who have, has parents who are making $10 million and they have a credit card and they have all the money they need to spend and that kind of stuff. And they also have to spend $10 the same amount as you. How would you feel about that? Would you feel like that's fair? Because everyone just gives a certain amount of money. So like, okay, that's good. Is it fair? Would you feel like it's fair? And if you feel like it wouldn't be fair, then you would probably also say, well, let's look at some of these countries. Look at Ireland, Spain. Look, Spain. Spain's gone through this amazing economic crunch. Right? Look at Greece. Greece was in default of its loans to the EU just a couple of years ago. Greece was on the verge of absolute, almost absolute, utter bankruptcy. Look at Portugal is essentially the same as us. So is that fair? It's a question. Like, what makes sense? So when we ask Americans the estimate of the share of budget going to foreign aid, these are the responses that Americans give. So ha over 51% or more say 10%. The average answer is 26%. So Americans, the average answer that Americans give when we ask what percentage of our GDP is going to non-military foreign aid, the average answer that Americans give is 26% when it's 0.3%. Meaning that Americans are sitting back, we are sitting back in our world feeling really good about the fact that we're helping a lot of countries and a lot of places and having this sense that, hey, 26% of our budget, wild overestimation of what it is. And yet, like, okay. And what that does is that helps us, I guess, sleep at night. It helps us do any number of things. But it's a wild overestimation. Even though we give more than any other country, it's just a thought. 
It's one of those thought experiments, right? Okay, so here, let me talk, let me walk you through something else here real fast. One of the other pieces of this, when you look at these, all these places where we give money, the significant portion of the money that we give is aid that is tied. And it's tied to some other demand or some other concern. Meaning that, hey, if we're going to go build a refugee camp right now um, in, who knows, let's say South Sudan, we don't just give the money to the Sudanese to build a refugee camp, or we don't just give the money to the UN or somewhere. UN is a little different. But we say, okay, we'll build the camp. So we take American tax dollars, which would be your money that you pay in taxes, and we give that to American companies to go do something with it in some other part of the world. Or we're going to go send $500 million worth of food to Bangladesh. So $500 million. So first off, we take the amount of money we need to buy the food from American farmers, which we do. Then we pay American companies to take the food to a port. And then we pay an American shipping company to orchestrate getting that food from that port over to Bangladesh. And then we pay another company, American company, to administer the, the distribution of the food. And then we give the food to the Bangladeshis. So when you see, hey, we gave a $500 million to Bangladesh, maybe we actually gave $20 million to Bangladesh. And what we did was we gave $480 million back to Americans who work in this particular area. So a lesson in how, what we do and how we do it in other parts of the world needs to include these other kinds of considerations, which is like, I know like, for most of you, Most of you, this doesn't mean anything, right? Really, because you don't have experience. You haven't been, most of you haven't seen the impact. Most of you haven't walked through a refugee camp. Most of you haven't seen the, what it is. You haven't been, you, you know, you haven't, walk next to somebody here you haven't seen wow someone's living in that house you haven't seen it and you don't you're not paying taxes maybe yourself many of you you don't really these are just these sort of theoretical things you have other things to think about whether you like i don't know whether you did all the readings for the quiz today or who, who knows what but part of what makes a good society is having an educated society and part of having an educated society is understanding things like this so that when we have these kinds of conversations in the world about what's happening and what's going on, then we can talk about it thoughtfully. So here, I'm going to give you like a, a, one of the, a, a quick piece about why, how we got to work in Haiti, for example. Um, Um, so years, years ago, maybe like 15 years ago, I had a student in class who was graduating. I was at graduation. She, um, was there with her parents and I was just standing around holding up a wall, I guess. I don't know what I was doing. Just standing there. 
And she walked by and she said, oh, hey, um, I was in your class and I want you to meet my parents. So I met her parents and met her grandmother, you know, the whole thing. And then she left. And then about three minutes later, her father comes back and she sa he says, hey, my daughter feels kind of shy, but um, could she, can we take a picture with you? And I'm like, yeah, man, absolutely. Oh, my God, of course, right? So, uh, so we took a photo, and I said, hey, what are you going to do when you graduate? And she says, uh, I don't know. I got this job down in the main line in Philly or whatever. I don't know. I got, but I got to wear pumps. And she, was, uh, she played on the women's uh, field hockey team. She was, you know, like you can uh, just go, imagine going from women's field hockey to wearing pumps to work every day in Philly. I'm like, uh, that's not going to work out well. I said, well, look, when you get to the point where you decide that your job isn't going to cut it anymore, you can't do it. I said, give me a buzz. I said, I have an idea for you. And she says, okay, man. So I left shortly after that. I went on sabbatical, and I came back to my office. I came back, and we had answering machines at the time. This is a long time ago. And uh, so she had left a message while I was gone. I was gone six months, and there's this message from her. And I'm like, oh, my God. And my wife deleted it accidentally. I was like, oh, save that, click, delete. I'm like, oh, shit, okay. And she said, hey, I'm ready for that conversation. So I said, well, whatever, maybe she'll call back. And then... One day she called back, and I was in the office. I said, so what's up? She said, oh, I quit my job. I said, okay, why don't you join the Peace Corps? I'll help you. And uh, she said, seriously? I've never been out of the country. I'm like, that's a that's perfect reason why you should do that. Because she had that personality, you know what I mean? Like a field hockey person. I'm like, dude, you got this. So she joined the Peace Corps, and she got in, and she went to Niger, Africa. And I'm like, damn, Niger, Africa. Like, okay, that's like jumping into the deep end, right? So, uh, very cool. Awesome. So she was living in rural Niger. And she stayed for two years, and then she stayed for another year, and then another year. And then she came back and started working on her PhD. And we wrote back and forth. I was like, a, we, I was like her pen pal. She wrote me these letters, these handwritten letters, from the middle of a really tiny community in the desert in Niger. And I still have them in my office. One day I'll give them to her. But... Uh, she came back and started working on her PhD, and then e emails me one day out of the blue, says, hey, I'm in Haiti. And I said, dude, what are you doing in Haiti? She said, well, I'm working at this hospital. So I said, hey, I, I want to come down and see you. So she says, all right, let me ask my boss. So her boss said, okay. So I flew down to Haiti. And on my way out of the country, I called another Haitian student of mine who I had met in class, and I couldn't remember her name, but I knew it was Jean-Louis somehow and I kept looking at all my I didn't even remember what class she was in but she had come to my office one day to talk to me I didn't even remember what class she was in. I looked through all of my my uh attendance sheets from semesters I finally found her and I tracked her down I called the registrar got her cell phone I had to really dig and I called her and she was getting on an airplane on her way to Haiti and I said hey I want to come see you because she had told me about her father and she said, oh, you got to meet my father someday. So this is a year and a half later. I call her and say, hey, I'm coming to Haiti. She's like, who is this? I said, oh, this is Sam. Remember from class? And she's like, Sam? I'm like, yeah, dude, Sam. So she's like, oh, okay, I'll, let me ask my parents. So, so I go down to Haiti, and I stay with this first student. Her name is Erica in the second floor of this hospital. And it was a hospital in a really rural area. And when you stay in a hospital in a really rural area, I mean, it was, the it was the central plateau. It was the poorest area of Haiti. It was just like in a hospital. It's like every night we're death scream. You I'm, I'm not going to. It's too, uh, I can't. It's just, it's different experience. So um, Jeff, we were in Haiti together last May, and Jeff knows the public hospital in Haiti. So he knows what I'm talking about. I don't know if anyone else does. Anyway, I left this hospital, went into Port-au-Prince, met up with the father of the Haitian student, and he became my dear close friend, he and his mother, uh, he and her mother, Ernso and Gina, and, uh, or he, Ernso, and his wife, Gina. Um, 
And then we started working with Haitians. And, and we started working with entrepreneurs in Haiti. And I started learning some things about Haiti that were like really, really intense. And things that I didn't necessarily know. And I didn't know until I really started to work there. I'd always known something. The average life expectancy, for example, is, is 80 years. Or 60 years, pardon me. 60 years. Y'all, right? So put that in perspective. In the U.S., it's about 82 or 83 on average, right? That 80% of the people in Haiti at this point in time live in what, we, what the U.N. would define poverty and 54% at what would, they would define as abject poverty. Now, that's not anything to, like, to say, yeah, you just feel bad about that or feel this or feel that, but, like, shit, when you... If you study the history of Haiti and you study the history, the implications or the, the role that the United States and other Western nations, in particular France, have for creating Haiti, it's a different kind of, you feel a different kind of way about this. And so let me give you an example, right? This is where you cannot understand the present if you don't understand the history. So, like, you couldn't understand who you are if you didn't understand your history. You couldn't understand your family if you don't understand your family's history. You can't understand Haiti if you don't understand Haiti's history. So, you know, Haiti was one of the most profitable colonies of the Western nations of all the colonies. And, you know, it produced half the sugar in the world and a third of the coffee in the world, two-thirds of the coffee. And Haiti was fundamentally a slave port. 500,000 Africans were taken to Haiti to earn all of this immense wealth for the Western world. One, pr the single most profitable colony was in Haiti. So, all, so you imagine, so this is the, this kind of mind, and this is how it keeps going. It's not just a thing of the past. It's the thing that holds today. You take this idea, like who has this idea, right? What, what we need, we have all this land in Haiti. Now we've sort of conquered it. We've, we've killed the, the, the local population. They've died off. Either we've killed them or they've died off from diseases. So we need labor. So we're going to go to Africa. We're going to get labor. We're going to bring people over to the tune of 500,000 over time. And they're going to work for us. And their average life, five to six years, was the average life expectancy of a slave in Haiti. Imagine just working people to death and all of those profits going to Europe. So like, you know, um, you know, you walk down the streets in Paris and you see all these amazing buildings. You see these monuments and you see these, it's just, it's just fabulous knowing that all of this stuff, so much of it is built from the labor of the slaves. It's like, it's just, it's almost incomprehensible. And then in, in 1804, so there's an uprising in Haiti. The black slaves in Haiti did what the American colonists did here. The American colonists were being exploited and overtaxed and abused and so on by the British. And so the American colonists overthrew the British and established the United States of America. And the Haitian slaves did the same thing. Awesome. Imagine if you had like a, if you saw a land of slaves and they were being brutalized. Like their average life expectancy was five to six years. You'd be rooting for the slaves. Of course you would. You'd be rooting for that population. Just like you think, those of you who are Americans, you think about our history. Oh, thank God we overthrew the British. Here, thank God they overthrew the French. But the world came together because the world said, hey, especially the United States. The United States said, we can't have the slaves in Haiti establishing their own country, the first black-led nation in the world. We can't have that because our slaves will think they can do the same thing. And so they, did, they boycotted, they completely cut off Haiti from the rest of the world and didn't allow these new nation owners 
to trade or do anything for the rest of the world. And we, in fact, just immiserated Haiti and forced them to pay reparations to the tune of about $150 million. And back then, $150 million is a lot of money, my friends. Basically, we ensured that Haiti would just stay poor forever. So see, like, you know, when you look at Haiti today, and if you're following the news, you would know that a lot of stuff was happening in Haiti. And just the past three weeks. And you think, wow, it's just this really poor country. A shithole country. As President Trump called it. And you don't study the history of Haiti and study like how things got there. You see, this is like why, for example, black people in the United States are always talking about slavery. And white people want to say, well, slavery's over. Why are you still talking about that? No, because if you don't understand the history, you don't understand where it's from. If you don't understand the history of slavery in the U.S., you don't understand why North Philly is as poor as North Philly is. Like, you don't get that. You don't understand inner city Baltimore. You don't get that. Like, you'll never understand that. You don't get Newark. You don't, none of it. You won't get it because it's all part of the history. And you won't get why all the white suburbs are as wealthy as they are because this is all part of a big move and a big chess game that people with power and money play. And so you wouldn't understand how Haiti got to be so poor. Anyway, what happens with us is we just started working there and we just continued to say, you know what, we're just going to do like a little bit of our work and we're going to make it happen. So that's how we end up in Haiti. Cool, and it's possible Ernso will come later in the semester. I'm going to work on seeing whether we can get him here. All right, man. Uh, let's go. Let's have the quiz. The quiz. Dude. I, you could just not take the quiz, and I'll just give you all A's, right? Dude, listen. Hang on a second, man. You know... Here's one of the beautiful things about this. Hey, if you, we need to make sure we fill all the seats. Hey, you can, we're going to move the, we're going to pull the cameras out. Uh, we do, wait, hey, yo, we need someone to take a seat down here. And we're going to have a seat in the third row here. So we need two people down in the front. And then if you don't have a seat, you can just go to the back of the room and someone will come get you. Yo, are there any other seats? Raise your hands. Hey, yo, two people right there. Dude, right, right there where the camera is. Over there. No, right there where the camera is. What's that?